Yeah. Uh, this, of course, is our second um, moderated discussion uh, of our 19th century baseball book club <laughs> that Bob and I <laughs> kind of concocted. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, we've had such talented people as Jack Bales and, mm -hmm. and Jim. Uh, uh, I, I want to say your name co correctly. It's Tchaikovsky? Tchaikovsky, yes. Yeah, yeah Tchaikovsky, that's it. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, we have Jim. And then, uh, next week, I think uh, we have Matt. Uh, the next uh, session, about three weeks from now, is Matt Albertson. Oh, and yeah. then uh, we have a professor, uh, Kevin Craner. Uh, uh, for the uh, September session. And I think we already, uh, Jack has given some indication of an interest in uh, doing a, uh, one of our fall sessions also. So uh, we're already uh, planning on those. So uh, so these are, are weekly, not, not weekly discussions, I'm sorry. These are discussions that would take place. We try to have a maximum of four per quarter. So it, sometimes some quarters, they may be two and it may be uh, three or one or whatever, but uh, that's what we would like to do. And uh, uh, given the first one, a lot of people's feedback was, wasn't this fun? <laughs> so <laughs> we want to kind of continue off in that vein, I guess. All right, so without, uh, you're going to get a lesson here. I know that uh, Jim also has these, this is uh, the original uh, Black Gods and Red Stockings that Bill uh, wrote, I think, in 1992. Yeah. And then all those years later, uh, around yeah. 2016, I think, or somewhere thereabouts, yeah. he wrote uh, the second uh, revised one, yeah. uh, which is uh, uh, because of time going by, all those years we learned so much more, he learned so much more about the... Uh, National Association that he decided to write a, uh, a revised edition. Yeah. I read them both and I thought they were, I read, I read the original way back when, and I read the uh, uh, revised edition. I actually read it to write a review on it in, uh, in, in Don uh, Jensen's uh, baseball uh, journal. Uh, so uh, there's a small review I did on it. And, he, and it's, it's it's just it's wonderful, <laughs> so, and it uh, it was a kind of door opener to really dissecting uh, what the National Association was about. Uh, you have Marshall's mm -hmm. books here; they're behind me. Uh, that's more encyclopedic of who played in the National Association. Mm -hmm. This is really more, a, you know, a history of it. So, without further ado. I'm going to turn it over to Jim to uh, give this uh, launch this discussion, and it is a discussion. Uh, I think we have enough people here, or or or, or not enough people here. <laughs> I mean, what I mean by that is, uh, I I think we can just kind of speak up or just raise our hand. You know, you don't have to. Right? Is that okay with you, Jim? Yeah, I think the last the last time we had a few more, and I think even with that, it worked pretty well because um, it was just like an informal talk where right. it wasn't always too many people all talking at once, and right. it worked out fine. And it's easier for any of us to try to not yeah. look for all the raised hands because we can uh, just wait for the pause and and chime in. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, Let me just Jim. Give, uh, one bit. Yeah, of, uh, Bob. Uh, guidance here. If you want to see everybody's uh, uh, thumbnail thing, go to the upper right, click view and take gallery. That'll give you the full screen of, of, of everybody that's that's here. If you go just speaker, whoever is talking is your picture and theirs is going to show up on the screen. Uh, and uh, if you're shy, although nobody that I've seen <laughs> log in yet, would qualify, except Joanne, of course. Uh, uh, you can use the chat function. Uh, just bring your cursor to the bottom of the uh, uh, screen and hit chat, and then in the right, a box will pop up. You can type in messages, and we'll monitor that. But we didn't have any last time, and that was available. 
uh, but it's up to you how you wish to use it. So Jim, off we go. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. And also thank you for welcoming me in. Um, just really quick about myself. I know there was a, a bio that was written up, but um, I'm relatively new to Sabre. Um, I just read books about baseball my whole life. Uh, I still play some softball because it's the closest I can get to uh, pretending I'm on the grass at Fenway Park. <laughs> um, and I love to watch the game. So having read books through the years and then playing in what is really like grassroots softball league that goes back to the 70s where we still just know that it's the last Thursday of March and what bar we go to and we just bring our appointment books and we schedule games that way. So I think the whole nature of what that league is really resonates with me when I read about the 19th century um, where player managers were not just a manager, they were their traveling secretary and you had to correspond with captains and set up your games and you found fields where you could even though even now in today's age, I've played on fields with a soccer goal in the middle of the outfield. And there's so many similarities. And I think that's why I love reading about the older game. And in reading those books, I found a baseball books group on Facebook. And I started asking some questions about finding other people to talk to about books. And one of them said, you sound like you should join Sabre. And that was only like three years ago. And, um, and that's why I'm here. I'm not a writer. I'm, I like to read, but I'm not much, much of a researcher either. So sometimes being in some of the groups and during COVID, some of the talks, um, for me, it's like looking at some celebrities because there's authors that I've read. <laughs> and um, I feel like I just am a reader, really. And um, in some ways may not be qualified to do some of this, but I enjoy it. Um, and that's what brought me here. And um, Having read this book, like I said, it really resonated with me. I felt like in today's age, some of the things that I do and the growing pains and mistakes that we do in our league mimic what was done 150 years ago. And um, and also I, I got to meet the author really briefly for a hot minute at the Providence Symposium last fall. And um, like I'm from Connecticut and uh, and I guess Bill is also a Connecticut resident. So that was really, uh, we had that common bond too, which I guess maybe in some ways helped me love that book all that much more. So that's what brought me here. Um, I, like Peter had said, I, I read the revised version, which is the updated version, which was, um, like he said, it, it mentions in the beginning, it was published in 2016 and there was new advances in scholarship and you know, digital, digitized newspaper research and so much more that have come to light. Um, he actually puts something in his forward about an unnamed leadoff batter and he goes, that little funny quip that he had written about so many years earlier has been ruined because now they know the name of that player and it, it mm -hmm. doesn't really sound the same anymore yeah. now that they know that player. Um, but one thing I will throw in is, I guess, a little editorial aside was I think that's another thing that really draws me to reading Sabre research in general is that um, it shows between one edition to a later edition, the value of continued research, not accepting what we think are known truths. Um, in other base football groups I'm part of, there's it could be something about the uh, reputation of Ty Cobb or what we know or think we know about the Black Sox. And I think Bill's book, the revised edition is a really a good lesson that we sh should be eager to learn new things and question what we think we know. And um, I mean, that's another thing that I love about Sabre and reading these books that are researched so well. And um, um, so going into that, um, I made notes chapter by chapter. I thought I would just go that way chronologically. Um, and if there's people, if there's any topics, obviously, um, please raise your hand. And this is really to just moderate a discussion of things that everyone is interested in talking about. Um, so it talks about, in the beginning, it covers the history of the game. 
And um, I think there's so many books that cover that. It wasn't something that I needed to get into too much. Um, it does talk about the game of baseball at the time being um, you know, played on, like I said earlier, fields with trees or water hazards. And that's a topic that'll come up um, in a later book talk when Matt Albertson uh, discusses level playing fields by Peter Morris. So I'll, I'll plug that future talk now too. Um, players would jump teams sometimes during a season. Uh, teams came and went and folded mid season. Umpires were never reliable and could be biased and sometimes didn't even know the rules, but were pulled out of the crowd. Um, games could take place between eight and nine players. So it was a really growing game. And you could see as the game grew that trying to establish the United States first ever professional league would also have so many associated growing pains and problems and issues. And I think that's what made the book very interesting too, to see how people adapted to that and see, and we know now we have that uh, knowledge to be able to look back with hindsight and see solutions that may have been so easy now um, that see how they struggled so badly back then. Um, why well, one thing I was gonna touch, Peter mentioned it a little bit in the beginning about the beginning, how this league started in a saloon in New York City between 10 professional teams representatives. They met on St. Patrick's Day in 1871 in a saloon known as Collier's Room. And it was a block wow. south of Union Square on the corner of Broadway and 13th. And one thing I thought to note that uh, of interest too of anyone in this group, um, today, well, one of my favorite places to go in the city when I'm there is just another further block south on Broadway and 12th is Strand's Bookstore. And I've gotten many great old 19th century books at that store. So if you're ever there, you could go to the where that Collier's Room site was and then walk a block south and, and find some good books. Um, I don't know, I, again, I want to pause and let anyone chime in if there was anything that uh, you found really interesting about this whole initial idea to come together, create the league. Um, you mentioned that Collier, Jim. Uh, what I liked about well, what I liked about the whole book is it was it was based on on subjects. You know, it was chronological, but it had like a subject on the game, a subject on umpires, a subject on this. And I, and I really, really liked that a lot. But in that in that first chapter in Collier's, yeah, you know, I love the whole long descriptive paragraph of Collier's. And that chapter even talked about the uniforms for crying out loud. And it was just so it was so well written and so descriptive too. And I guess the thorough description is what I like one of the things I like best about it. Yeah, that is a thing that came up in your book talk too, a couple of weeks back is yeah. when you read back, I think I probably made the same comment, but when you read books of that older era, we don't have video or photos. There was no internet or ESPN highlights. So we go by the really, sometimes really awesome and great descriptive writing of those authors. They had a different style then that you don't get reading the sports pages today. Yeah. Where it's just hits and runs and what happened. Um, but yeah, you're right. When it talks about, there was sections about just simple train travel and how mm -hmm. players would get around on streetcars and where they would put stadiums. And mm -hmm. it really puts you in that mindset of how it would have been living there. Um, I really do love books of that era because of that the historical aspect and yeah. social, social commentary and things like that, that you pick up. Yeah. Was, mm -hmm. was the founding of the National Association a, a, a normal evolution or did something happen that caused, caused that to become the creeping professionalism or whatever it was? What's, what's people's views to why did why in 1871 was, was a professional league founded? Yeah, my, my take on that uh, was that they were really trying to correct an existing condition of no one really making the championship official. Uh, it was up in the air. There was always disputes of who was the champion. Uh, there was issues about it. A team not play, you know, uh, not coming back to play, a, you know, a rematch, uh, you know, uh, 
were denying an opportunity. I think they had to win uh, two games from the opposing team. And if they won, won the, the, uh, the team that was uh, at risk of losing the championship would just ignore the other, <laughs> the other team's invitation. So I think they were trying to somehow formulize and correct what was beginning to occur through the 1860s. Just my thought. And I, that, that was what was going through my mind. And the second thing that was going through my mind is I don't think that they realized they had a tiger by the tail. Because the whole debate of a $10 admission to the league that was the, you know, in my mind, I was like, did they really think that ten dollars, you know, was going to do anything or you know, satisfy, uh, you know, umpiring or whatever? And uh, you know, to me, it was. Uh, I don't think they really realized what they were creating in a way. I mean, that definitely was a growing pain that they tried to deal with as they went on. There is the passage about the Middletown. Uh, Connecticut, uh, you know, the team management were trying to recruit teams coming through to play them. And Harry Wright couldn't be bothered, you know, for such a small gate receipt. He wouldn't even be, even if he was going through on his way from Boston to New York, he couldn't be bothered to play there. And then he, I mean, it was Harry Wright himself who suggested, he's like, well, why don't you just pony up the $10 and then I'd be obligated to play you. <laughs> and that's all it took for Middletown. And I'm, I remember it was laughing about how uh, it was written how Harry Henry Chadwick was apoplectic that this amateur team could ever be considered a professional team, like they should be banned. But rules were rules, and they had paid ten dollars, and they were a major league team for that, not even a full year, but for a short time. Uh, funny, you, you mentioned Harry Wright uh, last week. I was in. Uh, my hometown is near Chicago, and I was there for my mom's birthday. And uh, I uh, I went to the Chicago History Museum and, and to go through uh, uh, the William Halbert correspondence. I've been there several times, but his writing is so hard to read; it, it takes me a while to get through all that's there. But you know, but I did come across a couple of letters which Halbert's taking digs at Harry Wright. I mean, maybe they got along real well, but. Uh, he, he was corresponding with, uh, uh, I think, a or, uh, or C. Orc Bishop. I can't remember. What, was he St. Louis? I can't remember now. But uh, kind of digging around Harry about some of the things he'd say about the professional baseball at that time, I remember. You know, Harry says this, and that is just childish reasoning on his part, something like that. No. That, was, that was rather interesting, I thought. I uh, misunderstood. You see that Middletown team was a bunch of amateurs. They didn't get paid when they played in the uh, association. No, no, they were a professional team when they were. But um, oh. I guess Henry Chadwick, Chadwick in his writing didn't deem them to be the, the caliber to ever be oh. a professional team. So the way that passage was written, um, I don't think it was directly citing his writing. So maybe we should rephrase the question. Were all players in the National Association paid? Yes. Some part, some degree? Oh, yeah, it was a professional league. It was, uh, yeah. yeah. in that 1871, it was the country's first professional sports league of any type. So I know before that, from 1858 to 1870, you had the NAABP, which had mostly amateurs, but a couple of paid players or something. And that was totally disorganized. Oh, right. So I guess now, this is an attempt at organization to some yeah. level. Yeah, t teams were paid differently. Some were on salary, some were sharing gate receipts. Right. Yeah. And that proved to be, and I'm not the best scholar on all that, but it proved, it almost matched up where there was stock clubs versus the co-op clubs. Yeah. And based on, really, uh, based on how they were set up, tended to show how competitive and successful those clubs were too. But I think it was those co-op clubs, correct? that they would just pay the players based on a share of the gate receipts and mm -hmm. being poor clubs, they didn't draw as much. The players, you know, wouldn't get paid as much. So they couldn't really attract better players. And there was, I mean, there was so many cases of teams that played, you know, 14, 20, 25 games and folded before the season was ever even over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they played in tiny little cities where they just didn't have enough fan support. 
like Elizabeth or Fort Wayne or, you know, these little uh, Midtown Connecticut. They played in small market uh, teams that probably had, what, 40, 30, 40, 50,000 people in their towns. So obviously they just couldn't get enough interest. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why they had a fall. They couldn't uh, sustain themselves. It wasn't like Boston that uh, prevailed throughout the entire uh, eight, five years. Yeah, four of the five. Or, uh, you know, so. <laughs> Well, what's kind of interesting, I think, also, and there's like no limitation on how small it should be. Kind of how big a team could be, how big a town there should be before they put a team in there. But I guess they didn't do that. I think you know when I was reading like that whole discussion about how it came down to being either teams that were salaried in a sense, that were stock teams that uh, had some money behind them. And then teams that were totally reliant uh, on the gate, uh, you could see in a way that they were trying to somehow make accommodate both levels of play, you know, both levels of organization. They were trying to uh, uh, come up with some kind of formulas that would work so that the league could go forward. And uh, and some and I mean. It was around for five years, and I wonder, uh, maybe Jack knows more about this, but I'm wondering uh, how Holbert, who was looking at this, uh, began to really understand that maybe the stock leagues, in other words, the, uh, the stock teams, the teams that were coming with, you know, salaried uh, players, not just relying on gate, mm. really shaped his thinking about what the national league would look like eventually yeah i i've skimmed a lot of his correspondence peter i don't remember him saying that but that's not saying it's, it's not there uh yeah uh, well just speculating you know? yeah just uh -huh. I, I had an email conversation with one of our attendees tonight chris betch uh, we were going through that issue of of a uh, holbert and the founding of the uh, uh, National League and whatnot, and some, some things on that. But what didn't, wasn't that part of the reason Holbert put, you had to have 75,000 population. It, it was kind of a, a, a substitution for capitalization. You had to have enough to get fans, fannies in seats so you collect enough money to pay your players and pay your expenses and make a profit. Uh, Bob, he was vehement about that. In fact, one of my favorite letters that I, that I read, I, I think I, when we had that uh, program a few years ago, when we talked about uh, the Halbert, uh, I mentioned it then, is that uh, I can't remember the name of the guy I was talking to. It might have been Bishop again, but he was emphatic about that. He was emphatic about the alcohol. And uh, uh, he said, this is the way it absolutely has to be done. And he, and he ma kept making a point about how uh, you don't want the riffraff in the group either. You don't want the uh, in the National League, I mean, you want to keep the rip wrap up. You had to have no alcohol, uh, a good attendance fee, and uh, you just went on and on and on about that. You're just adamant about it all, in fact. Yeah, you definitely got the impression that Holbert learned a lot from the National Association's many mistakes. Yeah, in right. setting down his model of a sports league. Mm -hmm. Also cracking down on the gambling, which he showed in 1877 when he, you know, uh, banned, what was it? The Louisville yeah, team, yeah. Um, but, you know, that was a big plague of the National Association as well as the the throwing of games and or the suspected throwing of games by several players. I know Hubbard also uh, got very strict on not signing players mid-year after he had gathered his big four. And <laughs> so <laughs> once he had done his part of uh, securing Spalding and, and uh, White and some others there that he, uh, McVeigh, and I, I can't remember the fourth, but um, um, decided that maybe you shouldn't do that, so. <laughs> Isn't that kind of another theory behind him starting the league? It's kind of the, you can't fire me, I quit thing before you suspend, suspend me, I'll start my own league. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sometimes I, I wonder, and again, I, 
from the letters I read by Halbert, he was so he hated the Eastern Eastern clubs. And I wonder whether he started the league just to kind of get back at the Eastern clubs and everything else was kind of secondary. That's just a wild thought in my head. But uh, but he would go on and on with uh, with the Western club owners about the, the team from the East and uh, uh, the mutuals, especially. He had all these letters about the mutuals. He hated the mutuals and the, the athletics, too. Um, Primarily because they didn't fulfill their schedules, of course. Yeah. Yeah, then the Mutuals failed to finish the 1876 season. And then they That's just right. Put that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And he got Nev to put another team in New York. Well, the year after he died, they got the, got the New York Gotham, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I did have a number of notes. At the end of the book, the last couple of chapters had a number of notes of how by its fifth year, the NA was, other than the first season, Boston was just dominating every year. So there was really a lack of competitiveness in the league, which made, it was just a void of any type of pennant races. So at the end of the year, if teams didn't drop out, what games were played were not well attended. And that was one of the, uh, I, there's a mention about it, about um, Holbert creating the new league was that uh, the population limit, they did make the exception for Hartford just because Hartford was had a successful record, right. mm -hmm. but um, it was a way to weed out the weak teams. The, the teams yeah. couldn't draw, they wanted, and then really there was also the move from the NA was really a players league and now the new national league in, in 76 was really going to be controlled by owners now. So mm -hmm. there was there was just a shift in, I mean, there was also all that talk about in that last year in 75, there was talk about more scandals um, or even the press would insinuate that there could have been intentional errors and throwing of games and more cases of players who are drinking and you know abusive tyrant managers. And there was so many factors where the league had served its purpose almost and then it was starting to um, lose some steam, really. And um, Holbert stepped in, and I think he saw the writing on the wall and wanted to really create a new league with a new structure. I mean, all through the book, Isaac's book, I mean, like there's so many mentions about the Judicial Committee doing nothing about at the end of the year, they would just sit and let the deadlines pass, and it would be pe people jumping or disciplinary action. and um like you had mentioned uh was it mitch mentioned earlier that yeah once the national league came in and the mutuals didn't fulfill their schedule they were out and that that wasn't they never enforced that they had no power or authority behind the the entity the na yeah. um they just well, left. okay james i have a question that ten dollar fee uh to get into the uh, national association were teams vetted before they were allowed to entry or anybody could just pony up 10 bucks, have, uh, say, nine players and a substitute kicking a buck a piece, say, here's like $10, I want to join the league. I mean, was there any kind of a vetting process? Uh, that went nothing. I don't there's think nothing. there was, yeah. Uh -uh. There's nothing mentioned. Uh, yeah. I mean, nothing mentioned, just mentioned, like, especially that final year, that was really the final straw. That was a hard um, There was yeah. five or six brand new teams all came through, and then, was it four of the six? I mean, three of the six were gone in the first month and a half, and then a fourth one disbanded later on. But um, yeah, they all just, how, how did he word it? He said they were, I think, I mean, there's phrases that Bill uses that I really like too, where they were, I don't know, something about this influx of teams willing to take the $10 plunge. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, let's hop right in. There was, I don't think there was any vetting. No, like, and like you said earlier, that was what Chadwick's big complaints is really if you had pros and you had 10 bucks, you were in. Some of these teams just did not deserve to, to be in that league. Yeah. You stop uh, 10 guys ponying up a buck a piece and say nine plays and a substitute kicking in a buck a piece to say, I want to join the league. <laughs> and then to, to uh, build on what we were talking about, Holbert, um, it does mention in that final chapter. And it was telling, too, that we talked about them meeting at this little saloon, Collier's, where they created the N.A. And then by the end, they're meeting at the Grand Central Hotel. And it's a much posher place where they're creating the National League. But 
that was another thing that um, I think it was, they upped it up. It was a hundred dollar fee that all teams had. Well, they, first of all, they limited it to their eight teams. So they had already picked exactly who they wanted. And it was a hundred dollars that would be uh, per team pulled in. So you were, you were vetted for sure. And you had a bigger financial stake when you had to come into the NL. So okay, well, that makes sense. I mean, no. but that's, that's I think the, the whole premise of this book that I love is like, there's probably 50 different lessons that you can see that people learned from the NA mistakes and improved upon them later on down the road for, I mean, paying the umpires was another one. I mean, there's so scheduling, uh, fixed schedule. I mean, you can see that um, it definitely served a purpose and, but you, it almost knew like it was destined to fail because um, mm. there was so many hurdles that they would have had to jump. Yeah. Okay, I don't know all that much about the National Association. I'm still learning, but was 1871 the most organized of the five years? Uh, the most competitive. They did have, yeah. I, I mean, there. Well, yeah, I think it was right because Boston really ran away with the with the championship the other four years yeah and that every is, year they would win by more, I think and, more. more, and, more and more yeah year. yeah but as far as organization i mean it's hard to say um was i don't the, think the i don't think year, any year <laughs> i was i was surprised that they got through five years actually i, I was more focused on the administration and governance and um from day one uh, they never enforced anything. And so that just sort of created an atmosphere where nobody really, you know, was worried about the consequences of any of their actions. Mm. And uh, so that's what stuck. What's what struck me was the fact that it actually got five years under the belt. Uh, mm. it, I didn't think it was going to make it when I started reading. Didn't some of those clubs who ponied up $10 just to join, kind of played their first games at home. And then, well, we're not going to go travel anymore. We'll just cut our losses and, 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 and stay home and keep the money. Mm. Yeah. So well, that, that became a problem immediately, you know, with uh, teams are willingness to travel, particularly when they began to lose money. Yeah. And uh, particularly the teams that were reliant on gates and uh, they didn't have any incentive. Uh, it's interesting, though, it was a kind of self, in a way, they were selecting by who they invited to come to that meeting at, uh, at Collier's, that, that 1871 meeting. Uh, to some degree, it was, well, they invited certain teams to be there and send representatives to the meeting, and, and probably not others. And, and if I'm not mistaken, was it the Atla Atlantics that did not that attended the meeting but did not join the league the first year. So it was one team that was pretty prominent. The, the Atlantic didn't come in until 1874. Who was it? Maybe the, the Atlantic stayed out, and they were a co-op team by that point. Right. Um, right. Who was the team that defeated Cincinnati in 1870 to stop their winning streak of like 75 The, the Atlantics. The Atlantic. Okay, Atlantic. So that was that was the Atlantics. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, but but once the National Association came 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 around, the the Atlantics didn't want to be limited. They they could make their money with at the gate and not have to travel much because there are so many teams in Brooklyn and Manhattan to uh, to play. So they they kind of thought about that and didn't didn't go in. And but as they their players started to get pirated by other teams. They couldn't be competitive anymore. Um, they joined in 1875, and by 1876, 77, they were just a social club. Hmm. I thought, well, yeah. I, one of the things that that really interested me was was sort of watching. I was going to use the word watching, reading, but watching organizations, different organizations with the same interests, the game of baseball, try to come together and do something different. And I, I wonder, I mean, I've been involved in a number of business situations with startup businesses and you open up a business over here and then you wanna add one over there and then you bring one to a third location and different people bring different ideas, different skill sets, 
as well as different levels of morality to what they're doing. And some people are perhaps willing to cheat on something pretty readily and others would just be so dead set against anybody cheating that they would walk away if they thought that was part of it. And so you've got, you've got really trying to build, if you look at baseball today and then walk back to, this is what hit me about the, about this book, walk back to then. I mean, this, this occurred over a hundred and about 120 years before the book was written. And that's a long time. That's at least two generations and the mores and the thoughts and the way things come together. And this was something 120 years earlier that had never been done in any other sport, trying to put together a league. And one of the things I found really fun to, to try to figure out why, why did this happen? Why, was, was watching the different components come together and the co-op teams mm. who, you know, mm. well, you're kind of second citizens but we won't call you that. And we'll still let you play. It's just that we're going to treat you a little differently. Um, that was, I found that fascinating. And, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but so I'll ask the question, how, when this was written, because I found this surprisingly comprehensive mm -hmm. for a 120 year gap between when it happened and when it was written about. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the standings, the, some, the anecdotes, the, the, the back, the backroom meetings, notices and things like that. How readily available was this information? How, how much did we take our hat off to the author and compliment him for what an amazing job he did on mm -hmm. research? I know the book took him about 10 years to write, it seemed, mm -hmm. from start to finish, but what was all this information that readily does anyone know was it that readily available you know <laughs> if you know bill rysak <laughs> i don't i don't well, you could probably understand it i let me just say one thing about bill that was a, a revelation at the very first fred conference the very first fred conference in 2009 we had a panel discussion of uh led by fred Archer Frederick Ivor Campbell. Yep, yep. And the panelists were John Thorne, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Rysak, okay. Peter Morris, and um, from uh, McFarland Press, uh, Mitch, uh, I'm thinking, I'm, I can't, I think I'm trying to think, he's the editor of the sporting section. And the, what the whole discussion was, was um, how do you go from research the writing to publishing. Yeah. And that was the discussion. Yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, somebody in or so it came up like, how do you write? You know, how do you, you know, how do you block time to write? And here was Bill Rysak's answer. Well, if I have 10 minutes, I sit down and write. <laughs> yeah. And he startled everyone with that. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I take five days vacation. I go to some cabin in the woods or something. You know, he would say, well, I had 10 minutes before dinner. So I started to started mm. to write what I, whatever I could write then in those 10 minutes. And the amazing thing was that when you come around to reading it, I mean, Bill wrote this as his first uh, baseball history book. He subsequently wrote two more books, but they were in reverse chronological order, the uh, National Association is actually the thing that's the end. Uh, then he went into Johnny, uh, when Johnny comes sliding home about oh, yeah. the, uh, uh, that era right after the Civil War and the Civil War baseball. And then he went to pre-Civil War baseball. Uh, so he actually wrote three books in reverse chronological order. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing that was so impressed me when I read the second edition, was that to answer a little bit of Jim's question, was that things had come along and were developing in the research world, you know, the digitization of newspapers and so forth and so on. And what Bill was doing was he was continuing to discover things about the NA and its origins. And that brought him to write this, the revised edition. And uh, so you're right, there was, he had a lot, do a lot of very tough research the first time around. 
And despite that, he wrote a remarkable book. Thank you for that. That's very interesting. Be uh, before we get on a new thread, I want to apologize. Bill Humber had his hand up earlier, and I we got it down that rabbit hole of a thread. I want to make sure we get back to you and get you could get your thought in. Well, I, I just want to follow up on on an observation that the National Association doesn't get. I mean, it gets this kind of ambiguous, you know, consideration as to whether, well, is it a real major league? Is it not a major league? Uh, mm. it, and I know John Thorne once uh, described, he said, well, it was the nature of the ownership of of teams in the league that that kind of condemns it to a second class. I don't know what, what term you want to use to describe it. Um, a different kind of heritage than... Uh, and we all know what model wins in the end, the National League model. And so pervasive is that model that that becomes actually the model when the English Football Association is trying to organize their soccer league in 1888. They steal the National League model to an extent, but with one fundamental difference, which I think makes what happened in the English League and European soccer generally closer to the National Association and, and in some ways the International Association that followed the NA is the whole notion of, of open-ended membership. Anybody can join. They pay a small, the fee is almost irrelevant to the joining of the entity. So that if you look at English soccer today, it looks bizarre to, um, to North Americans when they look at it. How can a team like Wrexham, which was for all intents and purposes, a fifth tier team in England, do a major tour of the United States and play Chelsea, a top level team? I mean, that would be like the Dunedin Blue Jays and the St. Louis Cardinals going on a trip to Europe today in baseball. I mean, you would just, it just wouldn't happen. And Luton Town, which was a fifth tier team, is joining the Premier League this year. I mean, these are, these are ideas of, of multiple levels of, of organization and open-ended membership, which allows that to still happen. It, it's, it's changing and it's evolving. But the cast, I, I often refer to the, 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 the major leagues and minor leagues as essentially a cast system. Once you were a major league team, you, do, you did not, you know, you did not have any play at, at, other than exhibition games with or, or any kind of relationship with the minor leagues other than as developers of talent for you. And it's a somewhat different model with, with European soccer, very different in terms of that ability for anybody essentially at, at any time to become a member to the point that when one team, Wimbledon, actually moved, which is happens all the time in North American sports, when Wimbledon moved to Maynard Keynes, a bunch of local guys got together and formed a new team and entered the English Soccer League, and they're now in the third tier at the third division. I mean, can you imagine? And you know, if the same thing had happened in baseball, you know, if, when Brooklyn's team moved, if a bunch of people in Brooklyn got together and formed a team and could make their way back to the top tier. And I often think that the National Association was kind of had the potential to move in that kind of direction had it been a little more successful in terms of its modeling, but it didn't have any models to go on in those days. I mean, it was so novel that the only thing that might have been close to it was English county cricket. And even that was kind of more almost like in those days, tournament play than league play. So the novelty of the National Association is indeed that it was kind of totally distinct and unique in its time. And it just didn't have time in the long run to kind of figure out what in time it could have become and it didn't become that and the and the the national league model won out and so we don't even think of the possibilities of any other model but they were quite possible they quite possibly could have happened that's my piece mm -hmm. well in 1877 the national league uh adopted uh some criteria for admitting new teams to the league new you know teams that were already playing as professionals outside the national league and they in the next four or five years they admitted four or five teams promoting them mm. if you will uh to major league status not unlike the promotion relegation system in european football 
Well, for vision. No, well, it didn't work. I mean, you were out. Uh, you were over and done with. But uh, yeah. there, there was a similarity in the promotion thing. Well, it, uh, my my thought on on the National League when they would bring up Syracuse or Rochester or Worcester or uh, Troy, it's because openings occurred. Mm. They were trying to fill. They were recruiting teams to come in. They weren't just saying they're saying, "Well, we've got this plethora of teams we can choose from," because they had their own rules that you had to follow. Plus, they had to figure out. Can I travel there? Can I make money going there? Did that, you know, any number of, could they, did they have enough capitalization to pay their team and make it through the season? All these sort of things. I, I, I think Bill's, to Bill's point, the, the National League model was fundamentally different, focusing on, on, on clubs and this small sub club of owners. What was the admission in the National Association? Was it was it the same for all the clubs? Or was there a little jockeying around here? I thought there were two classes. Okay. Uh, if you paid your ten dollars, you could, you were eligible for the championship. Mm. Yeah. And and that had certain rules for scheduling and and those sorts of things. But anybody could join, and I don't know that there was even a fee to it. Uh, you got some contract protection or something of that nature. Mm. Uh, uh, but you couldn't compete. You could play the other teams, but you couldn't compete for the championship. Yeah. That was my, that's oh. what the back of my mind, I have a memory of. Well, I, I meant to Bob, the, the price of admission for a person to attend. Uh, did that vary from club to club or, or anything? Yeah. I don't know that any rule till the National League put the 50 cent rule. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah, I was wondering too. I don't remember if that came up. Yeah, I don't remember it either, Jim. No, I'm just kind of wondering. They did talk about some 25 cent admissions in some yeah, of the yeah. communities. That's or right. The book, there was something yeah. about a 25 cent game, and yeah. they, were, they were trying to draw a wider population of attendance. Yeah. And they dropped the price. And they did talk a little bit at one point about when the clubs would play their games. And they would hit their, you know, whether it's a championship game or an exhibition. So sometimes there they would kind of play a little fast and loose with admissions because it would almost draw in the fans as if it's a championship game, only for the fans to find out later. It didn't even really count on their final records. So I don't know. I <laughs> I think if, the if it was advertised as an exhibition, they probably couldn't charge as much. But I know there is a talk about that. Is sometimes the fans wouldn't find out till the, they were actually at the game and had it already paid, whether or not that was a truly a championship game or not. Well, that was that was a question I had, which was, did the fans, for the most part, really care? Hmm. Were they out there to watch a ball game, or did they care about the championship standings all that much, especially the marginal teams that weren't anywhere near a championship? Well, it sounds like in some of the games, if, you know, fit like some of those years where Philadelphia was playing Boston, just the, those are the top two teams. So they right. knew they would draw fans guaranteed. And I think sometimes they would play extra games, but they would be really sly as far as advertising whether or not it was championship or not. Because if it was an exhibition too, you could, depending on what players you played too. Right. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't remember. I do remember talk of admission, but I don't remember if there was a set, a set amount, you know, league-wide. Peter has, Peter has him. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I, as I was reading this book uh, over time, I began to really, really almost feel for Harry Wright because he seemed to be so much uh, so far ahead mm. uh, in his terms, in, in, in his managing ability and his organizational ability, uh, you know, booking. Uh, of course, uh, the Spalding tour of uh, 1874, you know, and, you know, it was really Boston and Philadelphia mm. that went on that tour. Mm -hmm. And of course, Spalding going 
as a representative in a way of Harry Wright. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, but I thought, when I thought about it, I said to myself, well, Harry Wright is the only guy in that league who has managed mm. a team, in, a, a professional team, you know, in Cincinnati. Uh, mm. he, he has that background. And where did that background come from? Well, it came from his father because his father was a professional cricket player mm -hmm. who had immigrated to the United States. And his father, Sam, really, in a way, uh, was, a, I think, a role model for him. Mm. And as I'm reading the book, there's countless, countless episodes where you're just saying, why doesn't Harry Wright throw his hands up? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, he can't, you know, he, he just seems to be so much more organized and so much more administratively advanced mm -hmm. than any other manager in that in that in that time frame in that five year mm -hmm. period. And of course, he he makes the transition right to the National League, of course. Mm -hmm. And he, he seemed like to see the big picture that transition to the National League. Like he had those four players taken from him, you know, mid season knew they were leaving. <laughs> And I mean, he could have been petty, thrown a fit and not agreed to the National League. And that probably would have carried some weight. But his getting behind the National League also carried some weight to to kind of solidify things and so on. And then even though Chicago won right in the first National League championship, I think Boston won the next two. So he showed that his system worked even with the, the loss of some key, real key players. So um, but seeing that big picture of what's best for baseball he seemed to have that whereas a lot of the other teams didn't you know it seemed right. well for themselves i'm not going to play on the road i'm and those type of things just going to stay home and gather some money and and uh and even the players with the moving from team to team and so on yeah there's a few instances of when uh bill bill Reichick comments on his being a shrewd businessman and you know, utilizing holidays and um, in that final season where Hartford really comes out of the gate in the beginning, anyways, they're they're neck and neck undefeated for a while, and and Harry Wright sets up that home and home series, back to back days where they play in Hartford and then immediately train right up to Boston to util, you know to get that fan furor behind the games, and um, he talks about how he's really shrewd. He knew his team was good having won championships and he would negotiate better rail rates and hotel rates for his team. And I mean, beyond the game, he was just as a businessman, he was pretty shrewd the way he ran his team. Yeah, I think that comes shining through in, his, in that book. Uh, that, that right is really in a way he's advanced, you know, I mean, you know he's, he's a kind of person who, uh, in a way is a kind of role model. And you can understand why he, he did, you know, make those transitions, uh, you know, from, you know, from learning from his father in a term, in a way of managing. And I mean, the red stockings were known to actually prepare for games. I mean, the idea of the hitting a cutoff man and, and doing you know things that are you know we consider today to be fundamental to baseball was really Harry or backing up a play. I was I was really Harry Wright. That was you know making you know guys do that and uh, and, and in a way he's just he just seems to be head and shoulders above them all. And you, you're wondering how he doesn't quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And on the field, there's talk of instances where he would come in for Spalding because he would be his change of pace pitcher and you know in an era where pitchers started and finished their games he knew the benefit of bringing in an off himself sometimes in the beginning there he was like his own off-speed pitcher to throw the batters off or um I know late I think it's in the later season when he had that really versatile team and they talked about how they could just put players all over the field and he would use them to rest and it wasn't even an injury situation, but it was to move them around and keep them rested and to better perform. And those types of uh, strategies were decades ahead of his time sometimes. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Well, one thing I wanted to, we're running out of time here, but one thing I wanted to bring up and throw it out there because I know Jack is here and others were here too. So since we, on the heels of the, the, the previous talk on Spalding's tour, if we wanted to go a little bit into the, uh, this initial tour that was in 74, it was just uh, England, Ireland. I think there was a planned jump over to Paris that they ended up canceling. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we had we had a good, great book talk on the actual Spalding's tour that came later. That was, uh, you know, what is it? 60 games over multiple countries. Um, but I wanted to at least throw that up there and give the people, uh, give everyone, everyone here a chance to talk about that earlier tour. Um, it just seems uh, right in line with the theme of the previous talk. I, I did read, Jim, that Spalding learned from his mistakes that first uh, uh, tour and kind of tried to change it all in the second one. Because uh, that was, was pretty much of a disaster, that first tour, I guess. No. As I as I read that, it reminded me, or as, as I reread it, it reminded me of some of the things we talked about last group. Like, yeah, how did they set up these? You know, when they're going to Ceylon and then going through Egypt, and they just added a country on the fly. Yeah, and Spalding had his own businessman as the yeah. lead man jumping ahead, and it talked about um, what was his name, Alec Charles. Alec was this cricket rep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they befriended each other and they had all these plans. And then when they came back for the tour this summer, um, Alcock never promoted, never did anything never like anything, that. Right. So that was definitely, if, if Spalding had his own, I mean, he'd be, we knew that he went from being a pitcher to a great businessman himself, but that was definitely a lesson learned is that uh, I'll trust my own, you know, advanced scout here, so to speak, to go ahead and set up the games and promote them better than, uh, just putting it in the hands of someone that I wouldn't see for six months, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what was the purpose of the uh, 74 tour? Uh, just to Johnny Appleseed spread baseball or because Spalding hadn't broken off into the sporting goods business, which was a primary reason to spread mm -hmm. the game in the, the later uh, uh, tour. So was this just uh, uh, or ha was Harry Wright part of this? and the family's connection to England. Yeah, that's what I remember rereading today that in during the 72 and 73 seasons, as these teams did, that they would play their league games, but they would do exhibitions and travel and make money. So both Baltimore and Boston clubs had did these mini tours where they went into Canada. Yeah. So have that Boston team having done that a couple times going into Canada, Harry Wright would have already had that in his mind about you know, his Boston club already had a, you know, the name preceded itself. So Wright, I think, proposed it to Philadelphia because that was the second best team. And they always, they did talk about the nature of those two teams. They, they were competitive. The players didn't really get in a lot of trouble. So they were, the temperament was good for such a tour. And the whole idea was they invited Philadelphia and they were going to split the money. They, they expected to make, make money on the trip. And in the end, it was, um, I can't remember. They, the they dollar 69 is something like that. <laughs> so much. Well, I read something a long, long time ago. They made a profit of a dollar 69 cents or something. <laughs> that was the 1869 cents. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think, and I always love that, like, because Bill's writing. Um, was, was that from that tour of 1874, or am I thinking of something else? No, there was one of, they did have the financial records of one of the teams during the season. And, oh. you know, Bill's writing is they made a handsome profit of, it was $8 and change or something. <laughs> oh, I see a hand raised though, uh, Chris. Hey, yeah, I know we're bad time. I, I have a question. I've just been dying to ask on this call. So I'm hoping some of you are maybe more experts on the style of play back then. But I know it was like in chapter seven, they mentioned uh, pitcher Al Martin. He was one of the last of like kind of the slow ball, like the lob pitchers, which in, in my mind is like slow pitch softball. And so he throws a three hitter. My question is how? <laughs> I, was, I don't think, I think I'm not understanding something about the. What was the pitcher's pitching name? Back then. It, uh, it was Al Martin. He's referenced several times, but yeah, in chapter seven, it says like 
Yeah, it said he was one of one of the last of the lob pitchers, mm. which I think that's he, he lobs the ball up there if they want high or low. Instead, I think I thought Jim Creighton changed the game. Mm. Jim Creighton changed the nature of pitching. Yeah, but but yeah, but I think by that time everybody was kind of starting to do the you know the underhand more almost like a submarine type. Yeah, the same ball. with Jim. Jim yeah. Here comes a guy slow pitching, you know, beer league softball. He, I'm he sub- yeah, that doesn't make sense yeah. in the, in 1874. I was like, I That'd be more like 1854 uh, than 1874. Could it be a side effect of the quality of the equipment? Could the ball, as the game got on, got mushier and mushier and there's no hair? Oh, yeah. Maybe the other team was on the take and they were just with on purpose. <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> it could have been something like, um, you know, akin to the modern day here when you, you know, if you ever got a great knuckler all of a sudden, and it's something that they're not used to that pace. And then on that one given day, um, they can't adapt to it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, the National Association, the five years of their, of their play, and those players that particularly have only NA next to their mm. name. <laughs> oh, yeah. In the baseball encyclopedia, meaning that yeah. they weren't around baseball, professional baseball long enough to play in the National League or the Mm -hmm. Association, but they're just an N.A. player, Uh, you know, gave me a a bit of an endorsement for the Negro Leagues uh, Mm -hmm. merger into baseball statistics because I said, well, gee, look, if you can have somebody from the Elizabeth Resolutes of 1872, (laughs) well, I forget how many games they played, not many. Uh, Mm -hmm. They uh, and and that guy's name is in the uh, baseball encyclopedia. Well, certainly some guy who's played in the Negro Leagues for ten years or so should be in the in the uh, in the the baseball Mm -hmm. encyclopedia. So it was you know looking at the NA in that regard, you know you just come to accept them as more for the sake of the fact that they're in the a player has an NA next to his name in the baseball encyclopedia almost endorses them as the as a major league. so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It, it had that kind of effect on me. Uh, but uh, I like Bill's style because when he was writing about the, uh, the resolutes, uh, he said something that today that feel, well, not long after it had become a, uh, a Hebrew cemetery, a Jewish cemetery uh, in, in Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And he said, just to think that of all the thousands of people buried in that cemetery, uh, the Resolutes only won two games there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh-huh. <laughs> you know yeah. it's a kind of interesting uh, thing. And what was most interesting was the Resolutes' first victory. First victory was against the Red Stockings. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. So I don't know what yeah. I learned that from that book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When they paid their ten dollars to get in, I mean, uh, and it was no yeah. vetting. And why was it stopped? Just ten guys poning up a dollar a piece and saying, "Okay, I want to be in." You know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I saw a vintage game this past Saturday um, here in, in, across the river from me in New Jersey, and uh, Flemington and uh, the Shamick Station. It's in the Shamick. Uh, they used their original Indian name is Nishanak. So uh, those two, uh, they played 1866 rules. Mm-hmm. And the umpire kept giving hand signals. And I was just thinking 1866, there was no hand signals. Mm-hmm. Jim, you're muted. I just noticed it, it told me that as I started speaking. I was like, we, we are at time. Um, um, I don't know if anyone had a last question. Um, I can hold for a second. But I wanted to thank everyone for the chance to, to come talk about that. Like I said, I when I read this book, I knew nothing of the National Association. So it was never even understood it. And I I loved the fact that it was so... You know, I don't know. It'd be like a bunch of high schoolers trying to figure something out and making a ton of mistakes and mm-hmm. learning as they go. And um, mm-hmm. the research that Bill did, you know, it seemed like 
like when you, like you were saying, if you look up these players online, like every one of them had played on three or four different teams within a five year. I don't know how he kept track of the revolving and um, right. little anecdotes and the personality of some of these players. Um, so yeah, I, I really think it was a great book. I really kind of loved learning something brand new and um, it was great to, to talk about it and to hear other people talk about a book that I loved and, and ask questions I hadn't thought of and things. So I, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity I enjoyed this a lot, Jim. Thank you yeah. very much. It was great. Yes, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Like, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Fun. I enjoyed this one, too. Yep. Nice job, Jim. Um, well, thank you, Jim. We appreciate the uh, uh, putting sure together this, this session. And uh, just a reminder, I think it's August 24th at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be Matt Albertson hosting the uh, 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 book club for the third uh, session with the um, level playing fields peter morris's book mm -hmm. peter's written a slew of books in the last 15 years or so um, and you just wonder where he gets all the information on the catcher the two volumes on a game of inches didn't they have fun he was the uh, leader in putting together baseball pioneers and and and, and whatnot uh, that the uh, committee was so uh, heavily involved in. So it's a, uh, give it a, give it a good look and maybe we'll see you all again in three weeks. It's a Thursday. I think it's a Thursday night. It's a Thursday next time. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks everybody. It was fun. wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. This is a good classic. Thank you for picking it. Yes. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Right, so long. Thank you.